The opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Cable 14, its sponsors or its shareholders, Kojiko Cable, Shaw Cable and Source Cable Limited. And welcome to the October 4th edition of Hamilton Talks. I am Larry Diani, and Hamilton Talks is a community affairs program that talks to Hamiltonians who are well known and sometimes those who may not be as well known, but are also moving our community forward. And we're very pleased tonight to have as our guest Mr. John Ellison. In 1967, John Ellison wrote what would become one of the most played and covered songs in the history of pop popular music, Some Kind of Wonderful, with its driving bass line, catchy guitar riff, timeless lyrics, and uncompromising hook, Some Kind of Wonderful is an instantly recognizable classic that has stood the test of time. In fact, it has sold more than 42 million copies worldwide and has been covered by nearly 60 artists. Born in rural West Virginia in 1941, John Ellison has conquered adversity and hardship throughout his life. In the 60s, he relocated to Rochester and joined a group called the Soul Brothers Six, with whom he recorded this song. Since the 70s, John has performed as a solo artist and continues to record and tour the world, creating live performances that bring audiences to their feet. In his career, John has shared the stage with musical legends like Smokey Robinson, Diana Ross, Patti LaBelle, James Brown even. He's a legend, and he lives in Dundas, Ontario. We welcome you to the show, John Ellison. Thank you, Larry. It's good to be here. Well, it's great to be here, and here you are, guitar in hand. We're going to have a proper chat. Yeah. But before we do that, we want to start the show with a song. And I understand the song is entitled, which you wrote, You and I. Exactly. Honor us. Yeah, this song was written, actually I wrote it um, uh, for my wife. And um, we're going to record, I'm going to record it uh, in the very near future. So it goes like this. The two of us share a love. love we can be so proud of you and I this love we share will never die it'll grow stronger as the years go by you and I And everyone will always know we're in love wherever we may go. We will always let it show you and I. You and I. You and I. Just as sure as there is a morning sun Our hearts will always beat as one You and I And on your hand I place this band of gold I'll always love you, mind, body, and soul, you and I. And this love between us will always be, it will always be just you and me, together for eternity, you and I.
Wonderful, John, and Thank that's you. dedicated to your wife, Margaret. That's correct. And we're going to talk a little bit about Margaret because she's okay. uh, uh, certainly a part of your story. Uh, and I just want to point out to our audience that you've actually written a book. And the book, um, I'm going to show it, is called Some Kind of Wonderful. Uh, and uh, it's obviously in honor of the song uh, that uh, has been so uh, well received uh, over the years. Uh, and uh, really talks about music. Uh, as being a, an important part of your life that's exactly. given you everything you've got now. We'll, we'll get to that. Right. But it didn't start that way. You were born in rural West Virginia. That's, that's correct. And you were not born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Far from it. That's far from it, exactly. So tell us a little bit about the early days. Well, I was, um, I'm the second oldest of six boys. Uh, my mom and dad, my dad was a coal miner. My mom worked as a maid um, in a nearby town where we grew up. Uh, my dad, I mean, we were very poor. My father was earning like $600 a year, which is um, not a lot of money. And, um, but he, you know, he did his best uh, to uh, support his family. And, um, but I had a different, um, I had a different vision about life. I wanted to, um, I didn't want to work in the coal mines. And, Which uh, is what people did. Yeah, that, that was the community. only source of income around. Was and in fact, I mean, people who worked in the coal mines were lucky to do that, and then the mines started shutting down. Right, exactly. And there's a scene in your book that you describe where the family had to relocate. Yeah, well, I mean, we, um, between uh, the age of um, when I was, from the time I was born until I was uh, 12 or 13 years old, we had relocated at least nine times because coal mines would run out of coal and uh, then miners would have to move uh, to other small villages or coal mining villages to, to find work. So now one of the interesting things you said to me <clears throat> was that yeah, poverty was harsh right. and there's a scene, uh, a number of scenes that <clears throat> sort of illustrate just how, how, how poor the folks there right. were. But it's not the poverty that really hurt you no what really hurt you it wasn't the poverty uh, I mean you can be poor as but what uh, what affected uh, all of or not just myself but what has affected um, black people in general is the way we were treated uh, and never having the same rights as others uh, uh, talked down to looked down upon uh, never given opportunities to excel and um, and that's uh, the main reason I wrote that book, uh, because of um, people, I want people to know that um, uh, life can be quite difficult and uh, that a lot of people, if you're not strong, uh, you know, you give up. Uh, me, I mean, I faced um, discrimination, racism, uh, but what it did for me, it made me uh, the harder someone tried to push me down, the harder I pushed back. Yes, and, and, and the um, book depicts that very nicely. Yeah. But talk a little bit about the the kind of issues that you had to deal with. Racism, obviously, was one of them. Right. But there was violence that affected your family very personally as well. Yeah, well, going back to when I was, um, my, my father told us stories um, about uh, his uh, brothers. And um, one, one, one incident he talked about, uh, quite a bit and uh, us as children we always wanted to hear these stories not realizing you know the uh, how horrible actually these stories were um, my um, uncle uh, lived in my father was from Georgia and they all worked um, on the railroad at this particular time and my father's brother it was a Friday he was it was time for them to stop work and um, everyone was looking forward to um, going out and partying and you know having a good time and my when it was time to stop work uh, the foreman on the job said uh, you only stop when I tell you to stop uh, my father's brother being the person he was he was not going to let anyone tell him what to do it was time for them to, to go home and he said well you know I'm leaving and with that being said uh, the foreman pulled out a gun and struck him uh, on the side of his head and um, knocked him down and uh, my uncle he got up and um, he grabbed the gun took the gun from the, the guy and he hit him uh, and knocked him down so um, but it was a death sentence because uh, in the south especially in the south uh, if you touched a, a white person uh, 
you're signing your own death death warrant. And in fact, that's what happened. Yeah, that's to your what happened. Uncle. He was um, uh, he was hunted down and uh, he was hanged. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, John, you were you went to school. Yes, I but did. you weren't a great student. Um, uh, <laughs> you 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 talk in the book about you know wearing hand me down clothes and right. Uh, people wouldn't talk to you. You were embarrassed. Uh, yeah, you had we, lunch uh, that that uh, you weren't even right. We look, we were looked upon as um, because we were so poor. I mean, we all the clothing that we had was from the Salvation Army, uh, uh, and um, kids. Uh, you know, they made fun of us. The the lunches that we had was made from homemade bread. I mean, looking back, I mean, if somebody gave, I would rather have homemade bread today yeah. <laughs> as opposed to store bought bread. But uh, at that, if anyone, no one would come to school with homemade bread because that was a sign of uh, your poor poverty. Yeah. You know, and um, so what I would do, uh, because I was embarrassed, I would eat my lunch before I got to school, and I would, when I was in school, I'd, I'd be hungry. I'd sit there, if, you know, and um, and sometimes people would give you some food. Yeah, out of, yeah, out some, of sympathy. But music played an important part. You weren't a great student. Your attitude wasn't the best. You admit uh, to that. It wasn't that. I, uh, let me refer. I was a great student. Actually, I was. Uh, I don't know if that's if I put that in the book, but uh, uh, I um, was even. I went to. I was in a radio on a radio co uh, in a talent contest, not with the music, but for spelling. Okay. Uh, and I was. Um, because I was so smart, uh, they chose me to go for the seventh grade graders on this. They, they did spelling contests on the radio all the time and diff against different schools. So they asked me if I would go, uh, although I was in the sixth grade, uh, they asked me if I would go as a seventh grader uh, to be in the spelling contest. That's right. You did put that in the book. Oh, okay. But your breakthrough moment when you were in high school was really at a school concert. Right. Where you auditioned? Uh, what well, happened? Uh, well, when I was, um, now there were two different times I was in the school, I mean I was in a test, contest. My, uh, what the really, happy time. Okay, the happy time. Yeah. When I, um, I entered this contest um, at school, and because I, first of all, I missed so many days from school because I, I had to stay out, help uh, earn money. Uh, and when uh, I asked the principal if I could uh, be a part of the talent, first he said no. And uh, and then he, I guess he sort of felt sorry for me. And, and well, he first he didn't believe that I could sing or if I played the guitar, so he they agreed to let me uh, on the talent show, and um, I won. I mean, I was I came out and you became a bit of a star in the school. <laughs> yeah, right? in the school. I mean, kids all, who the attitudes you. changed. Right. Every all the all the kids wanted to be my friend. You know, even the girls. Even the girls. Yes. Right. <laughs> and. Uh, which was more important than the guys <laughs> at the time. So yeah, they everybody wanted to be my friend, and um, actually I only knew how to play one song at the time. And uh, when they asked for an encore, I played the same song over again. Because you didn't know anything else. Uh, that was all, all right. Listen, and, and there's some fascinating reading. We don't want to give everything away in the right. book, yeah. uh, and I want to run ahead because okay. we're going to run out of time. Okay. Uh, you left uh, West Virginia. You left the family. Right. Uh, much to the chagrin of the family, and also to your regret, but you felt that you needed to get away from West Virginia. Yeah. And you went to Rochester. Yes, I did. Why Rochester? Rochester, I had a cousin that lived in Rochester. That was the reason I, I went. He'd, he'd come home a few, a few times to visit. And, um, and, you know, every time he came home, he was well-dressed, driving a beautiful car. So we thought he had lots of money, you know. And um, so w when I decided to leave, I didn't... Um, he didn't have a phone, so I didn't. We didn't have a phone, so anyway, I just showed up on his doorstep. To my surprise, he didn't own a home. He was renting a room from um, a lady in uh, uh, in Rochester, and she was kind enough to. Um, after I couldn't stay with him, she was kind enough to let me uh, uh, have a, a some space in her attic. She had a cot up in her attic, and she said, "You know, you you can stay there until you you know you get get a on job and." Uh, and in fact, um, she was very kind to you. Yes, um, yes. And and so you you made your way, you odd jobs, uh, right, doing whatever I, you could. I washed dishes. My first job, I, I took a job as a dishwasher at a restaurant, and um, washed dishes. I went from, but in my mind, I always had uh, this. Uh, my goal was to 
uh, search out musicians. So how did you then make the leap into music? And tell us a little bit about the Soul Brother Six. Well, when I first, um, uh, the, my first uh, musician that I met, uh, he was, um, his name was Joe Beard. And um, I don't remember exactly how I met him, but uh, he, was, uh, he was a guitar player. And um, we started uh, just jamming together. I would come to his house. and. Um, and we decided to form a band. We formed a band, called ourselves the Continentals. We played around for um, a few months, but he wasn't really that serious about the music. And um, so I moved on. Uh, eventually, I met um, uh, some guys that um, uh, they, uh, it was four brothers. And um, they wanted me to, they had heard about my guitar playing. They asked me if I would join the group. And I told them my dreams, my goals, and that uh, I, this was the only way I was planning on earning a living was with my music and uh, I told them I wanted to travel they felt the same way so um, I joined them and uh, then another guy came into the group and uh, we formed this group called the Soul Brother Six. Right and then eventually you also uh, joined a group that was white and black. Well that was prior that to was the Soul then. Yeah. yeah. Um, in between 1960 and 1964 there was um, a musician uh, his name is Johnny Detondo. He was um, uh, he was uh, a guitarist and also a keyboard player. And he, I don't know how he had heard about me, but he heard about this guy, Johnny Ellison, that played guitar. And uh, so one day he showed up at my apartment. How he found me, I have no clue. And uh, he said, I thought he was a bill collector <laughs> when I first saw him. <laughs> and he asked me if I, was, if I would be interested in joining a group. He said he had this idea of um, having uh, a band with two blacks and two whites. And I didn't have a problem with it. So uh, he said, uh, how do you feel about it? I said, I think it's a great idea. So we formed this group. We called ourselves Satan's Four. Right. And in fact, it, it did fairly well until yeah. um, you met some of the racism again. Exactly. We were, I mean, we were, we were an awesome group. And um, th his father was acting as our manager. He called an agent in Philadelphia and let him listen to us over the phone and the guy, the agent thought we were great. He said he'd like to sign us up. He wanted us to go on tour. And we, we left and went to Rochester and went to Philadelphia. Uh, when we arrived in Philadelphia, that's when um, the first racism was we, we got ready to check into a hotel. Uh, the desk clerk, when we came in, the four of us came into the hotel because the boy's father went in and rented the rooms. And he said, nope can't run a room to you guys. He said, um, you guys can stay, but the other two can't stay here. And um, so that caused a dilemma. And, we, uh, and they wouldn't even give, uh, give us our money back. They called, really? We called the police. The police <clears throat> said if we knew what was good for us, we'd get out. In other so, words, they, wouldn't, they took your money, and, wouldn't yep. give you the room, and then wouldn't give you the money back. Exactly, wouldn't give us the money back. All right, and uh, then you came to Hamilton. Yep. Eventually. When, what year was that? Came to Hamilton. I started playing in Hamilton in 1970. And where did you uh, play? I, well, I played, the first place I placed in Canada, when I, when I came to Canada, the first place I, I played was, I played in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I went from Halifax, Nova Scotia to St. Catharines. From uh, St. Catharines, uh, I'm, no, I'm sorry, to Ottawa. Then from Ottawa to St. Catharines. And that's when I met uh, a gentleman by the name of Harold Cutlett. He was a uh, a big time agent here in Hamilton. And uh, he took interest in a group. He said he would like to, uh, he'd like to book us on an exclusive base. So we agreed and um, uh, we started um, performing in all of the clubs in um, southern Ontario. Um, we went north a few times, but mostly it was from St. Catharines to Windsor. Uh, these are Toronto. And, and in Hamilton, the club you played in most was? Was the Swing and Door. We which were in was on the corner of King, King and Sanford. And Sanford. Right. Um, and, uh, of course, in uh, between all of that, you met a woman by the name of Margaret. No. <laughs> I had met her? Margaret. I met Margaret in 1968. Okay. Uh, when we were, um, be, before, um, we dated for f three years, and uh, then we got married. We got married in 1971. And Margaret is your current wife, yes, I should she is. say, and she's yep. the inspiration yep. uh, for your song exactly. as well. And she's a white woman. Yes. And just very quickly, because we're running out of time, we okay. want to get another song in. Um, you met her in Ohio. Met her in Ohio. And tell us a little bit about that. 
Well, when I, the way I, when I met her, she we were playing near um, Ohio State, the campus, and um, it was a place where a lot of college kids hung out. And um, she was uh, she came there one one evening one evening and uh, with a group of her friends, and uh, I saw her dancing, and um, I just told one of the guys in the band, I said, "See that woman? That's going to be my woman." And uh, they said, well, they didn't believe I'd even talk to her because of the color of her skin. So um, I, um, we talked, and uh, I asked her to uh, have dinner with me uh, the next day. And we met, we had dinner, and uh, as they say, the rest is history. The rest is history, and it's an interesting history. It's actually a wonderful love story. But she motivated you to write um, some kind of wonderful. No, she didn't. Well, not. tell us a little bit about the importance of that song. <laughs> that song was written in 1967, before I met my wife. Oh, okay. Yeah. The song was... Uh, it's about a woman, though. It's about a woman. Does but she it know this? She's going to watch yeah, this show. No, she knows this. All right. Yeah. I'm, when I wrote the song, it, I was um, living in Rochester, and um, this young lady, she was a friend of mine. We were not in love. You know, uh, she, was just, she wanted to, uh, to be my girlfriend. I wasn't interested in having a girlfriend because um, I had uh, goals I had to achieve, which was my music. And uh, I made that very clear to her. Uh, so she packed me. I was leaving Rochester. Uh, she said, well, I'll make you a lunch so you won't get hungry while you're traveling. I was on my way to Philadelphia, the whole group. And she made me a lunch. And uh, when I got ready to leave, I looked at her. I said, you know, you're some kind of wonderful. I said, I'm going to write a song about you. And you did. And that's how and the listen, song came about. listen, we've only got a couple minutes left, okay. and I want to hear the song. But uh, let me thank you and encourage okay. people to read Some Kind of Wonderful, which is a story of, uh, of John Ellison's experiences, and it's a great read. Honor us again. Okay. I don't of money. I don't need a big fine car. I got everything that a man can want. I got more than I could ask for. I don't have to run around. I don't have to stay out all night. Cause I've got me a sweet, a sweet loving woman. And she knows just how to treat me right. Now my baby, she's all right. Now my baby, she's out of sight. Don't you know that she's some kind of wonderful? Yes, she is. She's some kind of wonderful, my baby. She's some kind of wonderful. Yes, she is. Now when she holds me in her arms, you know she sets my soul on fire. Ooh, when my baby kisses me, my heart becomes filled with desire. When she wraps her loving arms around me, no, she drives me out of my mind. And I get funny little feelings inside of me. Chills run up and down my spine. Now my baby, she's all right. Now my baby, she's out of sight. Don't you know that she's some kind of wonderful? Yes, she is. She's some kind of wonderful, my baby. She's some kind of wonderful. Yes, she is. Now is there anybody got a sweet little woman like mine? Gotta be somebody Got a sweet little woman like mine Tell me, now can I get a witness? 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 I said I'm talking about my baby Some kind of wonderful Talking about my baby some kind of wonderful talking about my baby she's some kind of wonderful talking about my baby she's some kind of wonderful that is some kind of wonderful john thanks Thank for you. being on the show 
We've been in conversation with John Ellison, musician. We didn't even get a chance to talk about his food products under the label, Some Kind of Wonderful. That'll have to wait for another show. But we thank him for being part of our community and for being uh, a great inspirational writer as well with a great story. Thanks for watching Hamilton Talks. Next week, we're going to be in conversation with Joe Cardi, young Hamilton entrepreneur.